Welcome to the Sunday. Good morning again. Welcome to the Sunday service of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Laguna Beach. My name is Noreen Kukkanen, and I'm very happy to be here with you this morning and to be your worship associate. Our service this morning is entitled Talking Trash, What's New with San Onofre's Nuclear Waste Problem? Every Sunday, we're able to provide a service because of the help given by many members of our fellowship. Our music director, Carol Cole, plays beautiful melodies for the hymns that we sing. Our tech team, Pat Fl Pam Floodman and Don West Jr., keeps us on the air and connected as we traverse this challenging pandemic time. Candy Stock and Paul Bogdan keep our building comfortable, well-managed, and inviting. Candy's delicious coffee, generous treats are staples that we enjoy on Sunday mornings. Thank you to all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This congregation is theologically diverse religious community with membership open to all who are in accordance with their principles, mission, and vision. We're a welcoming congregation to people of all sexual orientations. And we unconditionally welcome any and all of you to our community of mutual caring and serious intent to grow as moral and spiritual beings. As Unitarian Universalists, we subscribe to no specific religious creed, no single creed, and we've gathered a set of principles that guide us and help us to achieve the kind of human humanity that we wish to achieve for ourselves and others. Uh, for me, the most important one today is number seven, respect for the interdependent web of all exist existence of which we are a part. We cannot allow ourselves to be uninformed or cavalier about leftover nuclear material. We have a responsibility to safeguard what is in our reach for the protection of the whole world. Today, people around the world are horrified, I'm sure you are too, by Russia's brazen attack on the Ukraine. On Thursday, Russian soldiers reached Chernobyl, where the plant meltdown in 1986 is still considered the worst nuclear disaster of all time, both in its costs and the casualties of people who died from all of that and the lingering illnesses. Our gathering video this morning warned of nuclear race waste raining down and Chernobyl was just about the worst case scenario. Now that nuclear plant site, including the radioactive wasteland, the 20 mile wide Chernobyl exclusion zone is in the hands of enemy forces. What happens now with the contamination still present and ongoing warfare remains to be seen. Today is a really good day for us to remember the dangers, the fuel waste that San Onofre presents, something that we can have a say about. The shuttered San Onofre nuclear generating station produced nuclear waste that is still stored on the premises. We're most grateful for the work that our guest, Charles Langley, founder of Public Watchdogs, and board member Nina Babios do as advocates for safety and accountability with Southern California Edison, which manages the closed San Onofre plant. That plant has 3.6 million pounds of radioactive waste stored there. We look forward to an update on Public Watchdog's campaign for safe and clean storage of that spent fuel at San Onofre. Welcome to our guests. The chalice we have in our sanctuary is our only symbol in the Unitarian Universalist faith. As our member Dara Skarecki lights the flame, I'd like to share with you the words of Katie Gelfand from the UU Church of Char Charles Charlottesville, Virginia. We call forth the life of our faith by igniting our challenge our chalice. The spark of new beginnings invites us into a sacred space 
to reflect where we have been and where we are going. Even knowing that this particular flame will intentionally end with our ritual extinguishing, we fear not its end, for we know with brave hearts that from every ending of our lives, we're sent forth to make a new beginning. Thank you, Dara, for all that you do for our fellowship. Dara is here every Sunday, assisting in the technical needs of our hybrid services. If you ask Dara for help, she gives it. We love and appreciate you, Dara, and have enjoyed watching your journey to adulthood. Big hugs. Our centering thought this morning comes from former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan. There is a beautiful slide. Let us be good stewards of the earth we inherited. All of us have to share the Earth's fragile ecosystems and precious resources, and each of us has a role to play in preserving them. If we are go on going, pardon me, if we are to go on living together on this Earth, we must be responsible for it. We will now hear from our wonderful music director, Carol Cole, who will play Turn the War World Around. The lyrics will be in the chat, so I really encourage you to sing along. And I encourage you to sing along as well. Please join me in this fun song. <laughs> Carol. Thank you. Thank you. We now come to the time in our service where we dedicate ourselves to the values that knit us together as a fellowship, the fact of our inherent worth and dignity, and the goodness that moves within and among us. 
please turn on your mic and join me in our affirmation. May we be reminded here of our highest aspiration and inspire bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that, that we are not isolated, isolated beings, but connected, but connected in the ministry and the miracle to the universe, to this community, and, and to, to each, other. each other. And today, in light of the current crisis in Ukraine, let's also affirm our stated in the sixth principle a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. We believe in the right to safety and sovereignty for the citizens of Ukraine and those Russians who challenge their leaders. As former President Obama encouraged, let us keep in our hearts and prayers the courageous Ukrainian people, the Russian citizens who have bravely declared their opposition to their country's attack on Ukraine, and for all those who will bear the cost of a senseless war. At this time in our service, we turn off the recording and have an opportunity to share what's on our mind and in our hearts, the things that make us all feel happy with you and those that need the comfort that our caring community can give. We're, we'll start with uh, those of you on Zoom this morning. The collection of an offering, what some UU congregations call sharing in stewardship, is a time to remember the collective responsibility toward the common good. Your donation helps to move our UU FLB mission forward. The UU Reverend Eric Walker Wickstrom said, the Lord loves a cheerful giver yet we'll accept from a grouch as well. Please contribute as you are able. It will make you smile. Please raise your voice in our song of gratitude. Thank you. We're reaching the point 
of our traditional meditation. This morning is a little different, and I, I hope it's meaningful to you. I've chosen an instrumental by a favorite of mine, Ben Morrison, for our meditation this morning. Music can indeed relax the body and put it into a meditative state. I find that this music today with its wandering melodies and varied instruments carries me to a quiet mindfulness. I hope that you will enjoy a departure from our complicated world as you follow the music. So I encourage you to start by relaxing your body as much as you can, your shoulders. Get comfortable as you sit with your feet firmly on the ground, with your hands resting on your lap. Take a moment to breathe deeply. Close your eyes if that feels right to you. Be mindful of the separate instruments as you listen. Breathe in peace. Breathe out fear and enjoy the intricacies of this lovely song called Celtic Excavation. We are pleased to welcome our guest speakers this morning. I know that we will learn a lot about what's going on at San Onofre and progress being made, uh, hopefully progress. Uh, we're pleased to have Charles Langley and Nina Nina, excuse me, Bob, Bob Yars from Public Watchdogs as our speakers this morning. Charles has been a public advocate for over 20 years, uh, focusing on energy issues <clears throat> that directly impact consumer rights, rates, and information. He's been a pit bull in holding the California Public Utilities Commission, as well as Southern California Edison, accountable for their misuse of the public trust. He founded Public Watchdogs in 2016, and as director, he has filed three federal lawsuits that are each specifically, especially related to unsafe conditions at San Onofre nuclear generation, generating station. Additionally, he's filed petitions with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission requesting that regulatory laws passed to protect the public safety be enforced as originally intended. While Southern California Edison continues to claim low risk for the radioactive nuclear waste buried, buried near an earthquake fault in a tsunami inundation zone, Langley challenges the utility to provide the accountability that the tax paying public deserves. We'll also be hearing from Nina Babios, who joined Public Watchdog's board after a career in news reporting and marketing. She transitioned into the emerging markets of alternative energy and transportation technologies and worked on projects including the 1997 National Automated Highway and Vehicle Demo. California's Hydrogen Highway, and the California Energy Commission's EV Infrastructure Committee. Nina became a founding member of the Southern California Regional Transit Training Consortium. As this nonprofit's training director for over 17 years, Nina developed and delivered alternative fueled transit specific zero emission training. She now serves as Director of Development at Public Watchdogs and is committed to increasing public awareness of the issue of radioactive nuclear waste storage. We're lucky to have these tenacious and effective public advocates working for us, and we're very pleased to welcome them, Charles and Nina. Hi, thank you so much. Can you hear us? You can see us? And I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, are you able to see my screen? Not yet. OK. Um, OK, how about now? Yes, looks good. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, get from the beginning here. So thank you for that very, very kind introduction. 
This, of course, is Charles Langley and Nina Babiars from Public Watchdogs. We were fortunate to make a presentation back in 2019, so we're going to very briefly recap what that was about and then get on to what's new and happening at San Onofre. So just to explain, the reason San Onofre was shut down was because they replaced their steam generators, which turn a turbine and generate electricity. And under NRC regulations, they are required to replace old parts on a nuclear reactor that are wearing out with identical parts. And they didn't do that. You can see on the left was the original steam generator and on the right is the one they replaced it with. There was no way in, in no way identical. So that was a big error on their part. And just to give you an idea of how big this equipment is, that's a, uh, a, a massive uh, piece of hardware on the back of a, a railroad track. So it initially, there were problems from the start after San Onofre was shut down at blue radioactive steam. They put the nuclear waste into 73 canisters that are about five feet wide and 18 feet high. They look like giant soup cans, uh, soup cans without the ridges. And they're made out of five eighths inch stainless steel. And the first thing that started happening in these uh, canisters was that these shims that run the length of the internal part of the canister, uh, they changed the design from what was on the left there onto the right. And if you can see on the right, um, these bolts started breaking. And uh, it's a problem because it's an important part of the cooling system inside these, these cans. This nuclear waste is hot and it's giving off heat at 100 and, or 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the second issue that happened before 2019 was one of the canisters was being downloaded and it got caught inside the silo, which is below ground. Now, if you look on the left, it's this huge piece of equipment that insulates the workers from the radiation. It has a canister of nuclear waste inside the shielding. And then we've got a cutaway view where you can see how they drop it down into the silo. And these containers actually got caught on a flange inside the silo. And because they couldn't see it, they nearly dropped one of these massive 104,000 pound containers, 18 feet, which is a problem. The only reason we know about this is because this gentleman named David Fritch was working. He learned of this and he reported it at a public meeting. It was uh, an extraordinary act of uh, bravery on his part. And later he told us he did it because his daughter asked him to do it. She was 11 years old. Now this image shows the domes and it shows what the ISFACI, the independent spent fuel storage installation looks like with the vertical cask transporters. And it shows these uh, 73 subterranean uh, uh, vaults that hold the nuclear waste. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Nina. Thank you, Charles. I just don't want to forget to mention that when the plant was shuttered, it was due to a radiation leak. And so when Charles showed you those like for like, uh, you know, steam generators that were not identical, uh, they removed safety features and um, they did that so they could put in more tubes to generate more electricity, to generate more money. This is a picture that we took down at the San Clemente Historical uh, society after a speaking engagement. And I just want to point a couple things out on this because it's before anything was ever built on <laughs> the site. And so if you take a look at, you can see the interstate highway wasn't even put in yet. But over on the left hand side, you'll see a recessed area. And I want to point that out because that's the area that San Onofre was actually built into. And as you can see, that is a bluff that was already eroded by the power of the sea. 
I want to give you an update, and this is an overview of what we're going to talk about in terms of our activities since we saw you last. We've been very busy. It's been a 24-7 uh, pursuit. We're going to talk about each one of those, the first being our federal court filings. Uh, you know, we started and we talked about this in 2019 at our last presentation, but our first federal filing uh, was back in 2017, and it was a very basic, very clean filed uh, violation of public law 8882. Well, it's been a learning experience for us because you actually cannot sue the federal government unless there's a you know congressional act of Congress involved. And this 8882 was passed in 1963 by our Congress, allowing the land to be leased by Edison at Camp Pendleton and with a very specific purpose. And that specific purpose in that law was for the construction and operation of a nuclear generating plant never intended to be a nuclear waste dump. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that we did not win that suit. However, it, it enabled us to pursue two other federal lawsuits, one filed back in August of uh, 2019, shortly after we saw you folks last. And um, it was uh, public watchdogs versus the NRC. We're asking these people to simply do what their mission has directed them to do, and that's protect the public safety with the regulations that were passed to protect the public safety. And we, uh, of course, indicated that there was a violation of the Administrative Procedures Act, which is really something that has its roots all the way back to the late 30s with FDR and what the public should be afforded uh, the knowledge and the activity of, you know, such, such a uh, pursuit of nuclear waste being buried uh, 108 feet from the Pacific Ocean. It is a public nuisance. And there's also uh, embedded in that lawsuit, you know, questions of pro product liability. The warranty for those cans, for example, is only what, Charles, 20, 25? 25 years. And, the, and their work is itself is only guaranteed for 10, and we're already eating up on that. I, I, I should mention also that the nuclear waste inside, just the plutonium alone, is deadly for a quarter million years. Um, this is solid nuclear waste. It's not the green goo that you see on the Simpsons. <laughs> Our second um, federal lawsuit was filed in September of uh, 2019. And that suit was public watchdogs, public watchdogs against SEMPRA, who's a parent company of Southern California Edison, as well as Southern California Edison SDG&E that's got, I think, a 20% hold in uh, investment in San Onofre, Holtec International, the manufacturer of the cheap five eighths inch stainless steel cans that are uh, holding this waste, and again the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. In both in both of those cases, Southern California Edison interjected uh, as an interested uh, party. Both of those federal lawsuits were taken to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. And uh, both were thrown out uh, simply on a decision with regard to the jurisdiction of uh, the Ninth Circuit. And so the, the, the court case that we referenced with all parties is something that we took to the U.S. Supreme Court and filed last May of 2021. And I just want to share with you really one of the most uh, critical points of that filing, which was also a learning experience. Each one of these federal lawsuits and then filing with the U.S. Supreme Court is just another ball game altogether, both in expense and um, procedure. But uh, we filed in May of 2021, and all of those companies and, and also the Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided that they were going to ignore our filing. And in July of last summer, the U.S. Supreme Court, which was actually one of the sweetest emails I've, never re I've ever received, was directed by the U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, indicating that you, while you may have uh, waived your right to respond. The U.S. Supreme Court was requiring each of these companies and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission defended by the Department of Justice to acknowledge and respond to our filing. And so from July of last year, um, actually, they all asked for an extension of time then when they got a reality check from the Supreme Court. 
Um, they were requiring these companies to respond by September the 1st. They got an extension till October the 1st, and then again to November the 1st. And their filings all gave public watchdogs an opportunity to rebut. Unfortunately, for everybody concerned, the US Supreme Court in December 13th decided not to hear the case. But that doesn't mean we lost and it doesn't mean that Edison won. What it means is that we may have another opportunity to uh, file with the US Supreme Court. We're gonna continue to pursue, but right now uh, we're in the court of public opinion and the court of public opinion is now in session. And so I would encourage each of you, uh, you know, I know that you're an informed audience, and I would encourage each of you that when you have the opportunity, whether it's at a family dinner or a social gathering, to help share the information with anybody and everybody that you can, because this is something that is of national consequence. We were talking a little earlier this morning, you know, we've got three or four of these uh, in already in the process of decommissioning in Massachusetts and New Jersey, Indian Point, right on the Hudson River. And um, with, with those decommissionings, the license is being transferred from the utility companies who don't want the responsibility mm -hmm. of cleaning up their own mess to Holtec International, along with the billions of dollars of decommissioning trust fund money without public hearings. And I, I, it's just such an egregious, uh, we're, we're fighting that as well. I'm going to turn it over to Charles, because in addition to our legal filings, there's also an avenue with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that uh, Charles and some of our subject matter experts have pursued. Thank you, Nina. Also, uh, um, I want to just very briefly divert from my, my little script here and mention that San Onofre is located on a military base, which means that under the rules of war, it is a legitimate military target. And, and this is kind of an interesting aspect of what's been going on in the, in the Ukraine, because one of the first things that the Soviets did when they rolled in was take over the Chernobyl site. The, uh, uh, the other legal aspect of what we've done is something called a 2.206 petition to revoke, which is a regulatory law instrument that we take before the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, to actually compel them to enforce their own rules. Our first petition involved the prospect of what happens when there's a flooding event at the facility in the instance of a huge tsunami or, or flood. And we were concerned that steam plumes might emerge that would, would spread radiation. Uh, they dismissed that, that concern and said that it would be impossible and not credible for such an event to happen. Uh, so when we looked at it further, we realized that the way the internals of this silos that hold the nuclear waste are designed, uh, if they were only partially flooded with, say, 18 inches of water, it would also create a cooling system failure. And if these canisters are not allowed to be air cooled, uh, they can overheat and it, it could get nasty. Finally, there was a third petition we filed because the NRC stated that both of the scenarios that we postulated were simply not credible. Now, the problem is, is nuclear reactors are not allowed to operate in an unanalyzed condition. And this particular issue of flooding has not been fully analyzed. So we're still uh, active on that front. Um, so where are we now? You wanna take this one up? Thank you, Charles. Well, where are we now? Uh, we've got rail lines that are compromised by a bluff collapse. I'm gonna show you just a picture of what happened in Del Mar killing three people a few years ago. And so take a look at how close the, pro you know, the proximity to the rail line going south from San Onofre into San Diego. And this is a huge problem. And uh, you know, I've spent a better part of my, latter part of my career in transit, I can tell you that for quite some time they've been running the, the trains along those tracks at a lower speed simply so they don't mm -hmm. rattle uh, the, the rail line. 
uh, here is an issue that you know we're all cognizant of, and uh, that is uh, sea level rise that's accelerating uh, much greater than originally anticipated. I pulled this particular uh, view from an Oceanside vulnerability assessment. The California Coastal Commission actually mandated every coastal city to do a sea level rise study. And the only reason that there was not one done at San Onofre is what Charles mentioned to you earlier, that it's on federal property property and then exempt from uh, that mandate. I, uh, we composed this next shot back in 2016. It was uh, exactly the area that's indicated between the two red lines that the King Tides ripped away about a third of the parking lot at Old Man's Beach. And I want to point out to you, here are the two domes that uh, the two domes on the right hand side are the domes that you can see from uh, Interstate 5 and then also just just. Um, can you show me how I can point that to them Charles yeah this Thank is you. where the nuclear waste dump is right there. Yeah, these two white buildings, this is the ISVASI, let's call it something that nobody can pronounce. But that's the, the close proximity of where the beach was already ripped away. And of course, you saw from the historical photograph uh, that that's exactly where they built all of this in the inset area of a bluff that had already been ripped away. The recent tsunami warning is, you know, exactly that. San Onofre sits in a USGS geological uh, in tsunami inundation zone. I just want to point out that what caused that recent tsunami was a power of 5,000 miles away. And uh, also something I was just reading yesterday, sharing with Charles here this morning, that uh, there was a NOAA official who indicated, you know, there were many people that were saying, oh, it was only three or four feet high. Well, what the NOAA scientists were saying yesterday is that oftentimes when a tsunami hits, it will only come in three or four feet uh, and then a wall of water will hit. So uh, I, I'm appreciative that we had a warning at all and uh, of Mother Nature and the power. I, I want to turn this over to, back over to Charles, because this issue of stress corrosion cracking has been identified as a number one priority issue. Yeah, the Department of Energy said this is their biggest concern. It's definitely ours. And stainless steel doesn't rust, but it does corrode in the presence of salt. And we talked to an expert metallurgist. And on the left, you can see here the beginnings of an act. This is an actual below ground canister at San Onofre that has the beginnings of stress corrosion cracking. Now, stress corrosion cracking almost always begins when there's contact with the metal where it's dented or scratched. And every canister at San Onofre be, was scratched in the downloading process. In fact, if you look to the right here, the lower right, you can see this very deep gouge that they say went 120 inches on the length of this can. So that's a future site for stress corrosion cracking. Now, why are we worried about it? It's because this is a microscopic picture of stress corrosion cracking in the crystalline structure of stainless steel. And you can see that it's cracking apart. Well, at some point we're gonna have to move these canisters, which means lifting them up, which means that we could crack apart uh, during the uploading process and actually put incredible stress because the canisters and the, the stuff inside them weighs 104,000 pounds. Um, it will be shipped by rail or car or uh, on the freeway, but if by rail, as Nina pointed out, it's supposed to go south. Well, the, the Southern rail lines aren't equipped to handle this kind of weight. This is a spent fuel pool. This is where all of the nuclear waste was stored for more than 40 years. And you can see uh, about 40 feet at the bottom, there's this grid. And those are the tops of nuclear fuel assemblies, which are square and about 18 feet long. That's what's inside the canister. And here we are at Yucca Mountain and Nina's gonna explain what's going on there. 
Well, nothing's going on at Yucca Mountain because uh, actually uh, for political reasons and funding issues, uh, it was, it's a, it's a non-starter. We have no national repository by which to move this waste to. And none of us have consented in all of these communities across the country to house it within our communities. Uh, you know, who is going to consent? And this is the next is big issue that the Department of Energy has just released a request for information on, con you know, on consolidated interim storage, uh, which is quote unquote consent uh, site based. And no one, you know, none of the communities, including ours, ever consented to housing this waste indefinitely. And that's really what we've got on our, you know, on our laps here. Uh, I just want to remind you, you know, back in 2019, and of course, you can see this report, it's written in a way that anybody can understand. We did a summary for the uh, radiological regulatory failure. And, uh, you know, as soon as the plant was closed due to a radiation leak, Edison did a couple of things immediately. And one of them was to apply for at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and were immediately granted massive emergency planning exemptions. And as a result of that, you can see these letters for yourself on our website. The federal and state funds for emergency response were cut. I think most of you already know that not only, you know, I think the last time we were in front of you, the sirens had been silenced, but now they've been completely removed. The control center uh, phone in the transportation management center, which is a point of, you know, notification if something goes sideways at San Onofre, the phone's been cut there for several years. That facility is co-located by CHP and Caltrans in case evacuation is needed. And anytime we've had a fire, that's exactly the center that coordinates all evacuation. And the first responders uh, are still unaware, and I've talked to them as to whether or not they've received specific training to go into San Onofre if something should occur, and they, they are still untrained. And of course, public education uh, is left up to nonprofits like us. And, so we welcome any and all questions. You know, we could go on for a couple hours. There's just so many details uh, that are related to the public safety and the public's right to know. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have and we'd be happy for you to visit our website because we are in the court of public opinion. We did have someone who uh, supported financially our legal filings. But unfortunately, you know, that was some restricted funding. So we do need your help and um, we welcome any and all questions uh, allude to some of the, the details or, or maybe some questions that we were unable to, to include in this presentation. Nina and Charles, if you are able to answer questions for a few minutes at the end of our service, we'd be really grateful. You, you certainly raise a lot of interesting points, scary points. So thank you so much. It was very interesting. And Thanks as I said, us. a little frightening. Um, our closing hymn today that Carol will so nicely perform for us is called Building a New Way, which is something we need to do. I'm unmuted. <laughs> Please join me. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. We are building a new way. Feel stronger every day. Thank you. 
That was great. We extinguish our, ch our chalice at the end of our service and Dara will do that for us. Thank you. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Please stand if you're in the sanctuary, and let's join our voices as we sing, let there be peace on earth. Thank you. 